filmpje. Volgende filmpje. Here we go again. Two years after its last general election, Britain is heading to the polls once more. Prime Minister Theresa May called the vote for June 8th, saying she wanted a strong mandate to negotiate Britain's exit from the European Union. At this moment of enormous national significance, there should be unity here in Westminster. Britain is divided into 650 parliamentary constituencies. Political parties field candidates across a number of constituencies. In each constituency, voters choose the person they want to represent them as their Member of Parliament, or MP. The person in each constituency who gets the most votes wins its seat in Parliament. The other parties get nothing. The political party that wins the most seats in Parliament normally gets to form a government and its leader becomes Prime Minister. This voting system is known as first past the post. The front runner is May's centre-right Conservative Party, which currently rules the country. It is less in favour of state spending and more socially conservative than Labour, and it also gave the UK its 2016 referendum on the European Union, when 52% of voters opted to leave the bloc. The Conservatives under Theresa May now back a complete break, known as a hard Brexit. Brexit means Brexit, and we're going to make a success of it. The Labour Party, led by Jeremy Corbyn, is second in the polls. Originally founded to represent left-wing working-class interests, the party shifted to the centre under the leadership of former Prime Minister Tony Blair. Since Corbyn took over in 2015, it has swung back to the far left. Corbyn's critics claim his left-wing principles and unpolished leadership style will lose seats and take the party further from government than it has been for decades. Corbyn insists he can beat the odds and win. We are campaigning to win this election. That's the only question now. Joint third in the polls is the centrist Liberal Democrats, led by Tim Farron. The Lib Dems have taken an unashamedly pro-European stance since the referendum and hope to pick up anti-Brexit votes from all parties. Also joint third is the United Kingdom Independence Party, or UKIP, led by Paul Nuttall. Founded with the sole aim of taking Britain out of the European Union, the party has since broadened its focus and takes a hard-right populist stance. Staunch opposition to mass immigration is its signature issue, and its support surged between 2010 and 2015. Since the Brexit vote, though, many voters have deserted it for the Conservatives. Nicola Sturgeon's Scottish National Party, which pushes for Scottish independence, is also important. It only fields candidates in Scotland, but currently holds 54 seats there, and is likely to keep them. That makes life much harder for Labour, which dominated Scotland in recent decades. This election will set the tone for British politics and Brexit negotiations for years to come. Yeah, good evening. Um, I don't know if you saw the last sentence, but it says, even if you know the ending, it's worth watching. Um, well, bear in mind this clip was made uh, three weeks ago, so uh, things have, have changed a bit in the UK since then. Um, my name is not Felix Kloss, my name is Tim Wagemakers, I'm program editor at the Bali and tonight um, your host on this night about the British elections. Um, it's the next in the round of elections we've had so far. We've had American elections, we've had Dutch elections, we've had French elections and now British elections and on Thursday in two days, uh, the British will vote for their new government. And as you saw, the main contestants are Jeremy Corbyn and Theresa May. And um, this night is called How to Brexit, the British Elections. And by saying that, we've kind of adopted what Theresa May wants. She wants to uh, keep these elections about Brexit and has called upon it to broaden her mandate um, in her negotiation for Brexit in Europe. Um, and tonight we're going to talk about that and about what the stakes also are for the Netherlands. Um, but things have changed a bit also since this clip. Um, so I think we also need to talk and we'll start with that when we have a panel discussion about the attacks in England and how they will influence or not influence the elections to come. Um, because with three terroristic attacks in three months, uh, attention has shifted in the past few days towards the security agenda, radicalization, and how to deal with that. Tonight we will discuss that also. And I'm really glad I don't have to answer all these questions on my own. Um, and I have two experts with me, uh, Felix Kloss, who is an historian specialized in, among others, modern English politics, and who wrote the extremely well-received book Churchill on Europe. If you don't have it, read it. It's really astonishing. And he'll be able to tell us more about how the British attitude towards Europe is, uh, historically and present. Um, and I'm also happy to introduce Fintan O'Toole, 
who flew all the way from Dublin, especially for this night, to talk with us, um, and who was awarded last month, also here at the Bali, um, a prize for the European Commentator of the Year for his work uh, on uh, Brexit. Um, and I, I think it's very special that he's here, because I don't know how, how many people in the audience are British. So that, that's quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and uh, how many people are not British, just to show the, the, the non-British? Well, I think then Vincent O'Toole is perfect because he's both an in and an outsider. Um, he has his ears in London and everywhere, but he's also, because he's, an, he's someone from Ireland, uh, a bit of what's involved with what's happening there and also the consequences for Ireland, but he, he can also translate it to a foreign audience what it means what's happening in the UK right now. Um, and since we're among us, I mean, um, I'm really happy you all enjoyed Dutch summer to come here uh, tonight and you all <laughs> crossed uh, the roads. Um, I would propose that um, first we're going to have Felix Kloss, who is going to give us a short introduction about why these elections matter to us. After that, I'm going to interview Finton and Felix. And I would propose that if you have really urgent questions, you just raise your hand and I'll come immediately. And otherwise, we just do it at the end of the program when there is enough room for all other questions. Um, but let's start. Um, I've asked Felix to give us a short insight into the British elections. Give him a warm hand. Felix Kloss. Thank you very much. I feel small in the presence of Finton, but I'll, I'll try to give my account of what's going on. It was the fall of the Berlin Wall moment for my generation. Receiving news that is inconceivable to the extent that it makes the consciousness nearly shut down. It numbs the mind. You're made aware of a fact that seconds ago before immutably belonged to the realm of the impossible. A fact that in split seconds shatters the illusion of permanence of the world that you were born into, the world that you know, or the world that you thought you knew. The disoriented mind immediately starts clearing up shards of reality by mapping out in excruciating detail a new reality. The outside world exactly as it is, at the exact moment the news is received. Everybody who was alive in 1989 doesn't need much prodding to tell you in very boring detail really what happened and how they felt and who they were with in 1989 <laughs> when the wall came down. You will all remember, as I do, where you were and who you were with the precise moment it became clear that Britain had voted to leave the European Union. You'll probably remember the terrified expression on Boris Johnson's face when he realized that he had inadvertently won the campaign. And you may remember some of the Leave campaign's distortions of truth and democracy demeaning antics. The end result of which, I believe, will swindle a generation of young British Europeans out of their futures. You may remember tears of anguish, or perhaps more jarringly, UKIP tears of joy. It took just a few hours for David Cameron to announce his resignation. And it took less than a month for Theresa May, the ultimate political survivor at the Home Office, to assume the premiership. She boasted a reputation for unflappability and decisiveness, qualities which I think were in short supply at the time. May had supported Cameron's lukewarm and ineffective campaign to remain in the European Union, but with the vote against, she quickly embraced the kind of Brexit proposed by Nigel Farage, the most severely isolationist option on the table. Brexit means Brexit, became her mantra. She repeated it over and over again, as if to reassure British tabloid readers that the would-be saboteurs, those citizens of nowhere, would be crushed. She was championed by Brexit fan, pro-golfer, and part-time would-be leader of the free world, Donald Trump. And she professed her love for a clean Brexit as passionately as the Dark Lord of Mar-a-Lago professed his for clean coal. She had vowed to not call a general election before her term was up. But she sensed an opportunity in the opposition. The deeply divided and unpopular Labour Party under the leadership of the pseudo-Marxist, half-wit maybe, Jeremy Corbyn, was too tempting a prospect to pass up. And with the snap election, 
she hoped to wipe out the Socialist Party for once and for all. But now, just six weeks later, respectable polling firms are predicting a born-again Corbyn to give Prime Minister May a real run for her money. May's lead in the poll shrunk from 20 to 7 points, and anything below a 150-seat majority will be perceived as a loss for the Conservatives. Who wins will define the British approach to the impending negotiations with the European Union, both on the divorce settlement first and then on a possible future trading relationship. The only problem is, neither Corbyn nor May seems to have a particularly good grasp of what's in store for Britain. Corbyn, who's a longtime Eurosceptic, uh, who voted against British membership of the European Economic Community, has decided for the sake of his Brexit voting constituencies that he should support May in taking Britain out of the European Union. Beyond a friendlier tone, I believe he offers no more developed ideas on how to get a good deal for Britain in Brussels than his rival does. Neither leader seems to really understand that the deck is stacked against Britain. You cannot claim to have the upper hand in negotiation with a block of nations that's seven times your size. 44% of British exports go to the European Union, while only 8% of European Union exports go to Britain. 13% of British GDP is dependent on trade with the EU, while only 3% of EU GDP is dependent on trade with Britain. Certainly the Germans will want to continue selling their cars in Britain, if at all possible, as I'm sure Nigel Farage will keep reminding you. But by now, it's delusional to assume that economic commercial interests will always trump the European wish to protect its political unity. Angela Merkel, at the very least, has already assured herself of the German automakers' pledge that they will take a hit on their sales in the national interest, which I have to tell you, the national interest is understood to be synonymous with the interest of the European Union. You cannot enjoy the fruits of the largest integrated market in the world while refusing to be a, an integral part of the independent legal order on which it is based, that supports it, and without which it simply cannot exist. You cannot be part of an integrated market that flows from a unity of laws without recognizing the authority of the court that is enforcing, interpreting, and developing those laws. You cannot, finally, make up for lost trade with Europe through deals with remote, relatively insignificant trade partners. Britain trades more with Ireland than with China, twice as much with Belgium as with India, and three times as much with Sweden as with Brazil. Geography dictates that the weather will continue to come from Europe. And yet, Britain is at risk of crashing out of the European Union without any clear plans for finding a new role in the world. In a sense, and this is what I'm here to tell you, this is particularly problematic for us here in the Netherlands. Long-standing and natural seafaring partners in pursuit of European free trade the Dutch stand to suffer disproportional economic damage from Brexit. We send around 10% of our total exports to the UK. In case Britain does crash out of the EU without a free trade agreement, according to the, an authoritative report by the Netherlands Bureau for Economic Policy Analysis at Central Plan Bureau, trade flows between our countries will be reduced by 55%. Total Dutch trade will decrease by 4%. GDP in the Netherlands will decrease by 1.2%, and average wages will decrease by a percent. If the next British government and the EU succeed in negotiating a free trade agreement, at least within the next 10 years, and we shall need all the luck and all the wisdom in the world if we are to move together in this way, bilateral Dutch-British free trade is still reduced by 30%. We lose 0.9% of our total wealth, and we'll see a 0.7% reduction in average wages. This is no joke for our country. In another sense, and this is more on the positive side, I think, 
Brexit offers a sort of bittersweet opportunity for the European Union to solve some of its structural problems, integrate further, and make its own way in the world. But tragically, I think Britain's fate is now in the hand of a still relatively small but growing majority that's in the suffocating grip of the illusion of national grandeur, self-importance, and exceptionalism. From the Great British Bake Off to the Great British Suing Bee and the hollow clatter of May's red, white, and blue Brexit, Britain seems to have collectively lost touch with reality. It happens. History teaches us that it happens to entire peoples, even to the most successful ones. About 80 years ago, the Germans threw away their future, sold as they were on the absurd fairy tale that the very existence of their nation was under threat from immigrants and elites from nowhere, with roots nowhere. Now the Brits have fallen for Rupert Murdoch's cynical lies about a faceless Brussels elite. Brussels wants to take away British money for the NHS and British kettles. Brussels forces the British to eat straight bananas, and it unleashes upon the British people hordes of hard-working Eastern European builders, nurses, garbage men, waiters, and farmers that are, well, all so foreign. So where is Britain heading under this illusion? The answer, I believe, is nowhere, because it can't. Britain is part of Europe. It will always be. Geography matters. Barack Obama's brilliant comment on the Trump era was simply to observe that reality has a way of asserting itself. Britain is on a collision course with reality, the reality of geography. What May calls the promise of Brexit is more than a fallacy. It is lunacy. It is an Alice in Wonderland-like turnaround. It can only make sense if you are looking through the looking glass. Once you start believing in fairy tales, you can simply deny geography. I hope you will forgive me uh, at this time for permitting myself to quote from Winston Churchill, a great British statesman, maybe one of the greatest statesmen in world history, who also happened to have campaigned passionately for a kind of United States of Europe and indeed a kind of European Union in which Britain would take part. Churchill never lost sight of geography. Warning of the gathering storm of nationalism on the European continent in the 1930s, he said, there are those who say, let us ignore the continent of Europe. Let us leave it to stew in its own juice, to fight out its own quarrels. Let us turn our backs upon this alarming scene. Let us fix our gaze across the ocean and lead our own life in the midst of our peace-loving dominions and empire. He continued, there is much to be said for this plan if only we could unfasten the British islands from their rock foundations and could tow them 3,000 miles across the Atlantic Ocean and anchor them safely upon the smiling coasts of Canada. I have not heard of any way in which this could be done. No engineer has come forward with any scheme. Even our best scientists are dumb. Is it prudent? Is it possible, however we might desire it, to turn our backs upon Europe and ignore whatever may happen there? Everyone can judge this question for himself. It lies at the heart of our problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. You can, you can sit there. Um, I just wanted to ask you before I get Finton on stage. Um, they're living in this big illusion, but at the same time, uh, I think Labour is uh, pro-Brexit. Uh, the Conservative Party is pro-Brexit. How do you look upon that then? Is the soup hotter? I don't know if the Dutch expression <laughs> translates to English, <laughs> but will I'm something change sure after the election? Or do you really think that this course that you are projecting to us now is really the route it's going to take? Yes, I, th I think Brexit will happen and it will probably happen in the hardest possible way. Maybe 
uh, we'll have a standstill this summer uh, when we start negotiating about what it will cost to uh, get a divorce settlement. So no, I don't see a way where we get a sort of soft Brexit or um, no Brexit at all. I do, I do think this, this course yeah. will, will run the way that it does. Yeah. Um. Um, I'd like to invite to the stage, and I've re already introduced him, uh, Fintan O'Toole. He is European Commentator of the Year. He writes for the Irish Times, and he writes a lot about Brexit. Uh, Fintan O'Toole. Yeah. Good evening. Um, before we turn to um, well, everything we, we want to talk about, um, for example, the effect of the attacks, the Brexit, uh, other domestic issues that are at stake, um, you are from Ireland. Does the British election, um, well, what does it mean to the Irish people, to Ireland? Is it important for them? It, it's very important. Um, we're in the unfortunate position of having to live with the consequences of British decisions without being able to really affect them. Um, obviously, Ireland, as you know, is divided between North, the, the six northern counties, which are still part of the United Kingdom, and the rest of Ireland, most of Ireland, which I come from, which is an independent country. Um, but we still share an island. We, we share a border uh, with the United Kingdom, a land border. We're the only country that does so. Um, and that land border ceased to matter in my lifetime. It's one of the most uh, heartening things that's happened. I mean, we know that it was a contested border. We know that it was a site of conflict. I won't bore you with the details of Irish history, but you, you know that you know, for 30 years uh, there was a vicious uh, sectarian conflict in Northern Ireland, which obviously spilled over and affected yeah. my generation of people in the Republic. And the recklessness of Brexit in bringing that back, uh, in saying, without even thinking about it, without a single moment of thought, just saying, not only are you going back to a border, but it's going to be a much more significant border than it's ever been in history. It's going to be a European Union border. It's going to be a border between a block of 26 countries and, and, and one country outside the European Union. Um, it is, to me, rather intolerable. So what happens in this election matters enormously to us. Um, physically. Physically. I mean, it's just, yeah. you know, so uh, economically, of course, we're, uh, um, I mean, Felix gave a brilliant um, description yeah. of the effects on, on the Netherlands, but you know, we're even more um, economically integrated into the British markets. Most small Irish businesses, which I mean, yeah. as you know, in, in every country it's the small businesses are the ones that actually employ most people. Uh, food businesses, um, you know, all sorts of uh, small to medium yeah. enterprises, they, they sell into the British market yeah. by and large. Uh, so the effects on employment uh, are, 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 are very severe, um, but, but the biggest effects are the effects on on our, on our history, you know, so, so we worked really hard to solve this conflict. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the great achievements. I mean, we all look back on that period after the fall of Berlin Wall when there was hope in the world, and a lot of that hope turned sour. And one of the things that didn't turn sour was the Northern Ireland peace process. It's problematic, it's not perfect, but it worked. Nobody's been killed, and nobody has been killed in Northern Ireland. Um, you know, for, for the yeah. last 17 years or so, uh, well, very, very few people, I mean, al almost nobody. That's a really significant European and world achievement. So and you're quite insecure about what the effects will be so, of... So, yeah. so, yeah, this reopens all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, where I would maybe slightly disagree with, with Felix is that I, I think as the British election has unfolded, there is more at stake in terms of Brexit mm. than might have appeared to be. Yeah. So it looked like an election which was simply about, well, not an election, but a coronation. Right? So I don't know if you've been in Britain or you've watched any of it. I mean, the word conservative party didn't appear. You know, it was the Theresa May election. Um, you know, on the buses, on the posters, it was just Theresa May. And if she had to refer to the party, they were Theresa May's team. <laughs> you know? uh, and this ludicrous attempt to start a personality cult around somebody who has no personality. It's not, not a very good <laughs> policy, I think. But, um, so the, the, the plan was for this coronation, which was going to deliver Theresa May a, a mm. majority of 200 plus seats, as Felix said, going to destroy the Labour Party forever, and really lead to a kind of a creation of a one-party state in England, not so much in Britain, but in England. 
which would then be in a position to, yeah. as she thought, negotiate in a hard way with, with, with the rest of Europe. But that's unraveled spectacularly. Yeah. And let's unravel that a bit later, but first start with something that, well, uh, uh, hit the news most last week. We have a short clip about, um, well, shortly about the text, but mostly about the responses with regard to the election. Um, so we could talk a bit about that, but let's first see the clip. Three deadly attacks in just three months. More than 30 people killed. Security and the response to the ISIL threat have become a central concern as Britain prepares to go to the polls this week. In the past seven years, both as Home Secretary and then Prime Minister, Theresa May has overseen policing cuts resulting in 20,000 fewer officers. After giving a statement about the London Bridge attack on Monday, she tried to steer the political agenda onto Brexit and the economy. But instead, she was repeatedly pressed on those police cuts. You accused those who were concerned about police cuts of crying wolf. Do you accept now that you were wrong to say that? Would it not be leadership to say that you would reverse those cuts? And would that mean you were wrong to cut numbers? Do you worry about what that says about your record? Well, over the past three months, we have had the three attacks. The police and the security services have also foiled five other attacks. Visiting the scene of the London Bridge attack and with London's police chief at his side, the London mayor refuted the Prime Minister's claims that she'd maintained police budgets. It's, uh, it's just a fact that over the last uh, seven years, we as a city have lost uh, uh, £600 million from our budget. Uh, we have had to close police stations, sell police buildings, uh, we've lost uh, uh, thousands of police staff. Theresa May's speech had accused opposition leader Jeremy Corbyn of an abdication of leadership. Mr Corbyn hit back, saying it was the Prime Minister's leadership that was now in question. She was at the Home Office for all this time, presided over this cut, these cuts in police numbers, and now was saying that we have a problem. Yes, we do have a problem. We should never have cut the police numbers. The general election on Thursday of this week had been seen as almost a single issue ballot. A straight choice between which of the parties would be best at handling Britain's exit from the European Union. But the attacks at Westminster, Manchester and now here at London Bridge have thrown the campaigning and perhaps even the election result up in the air. A Dutch um, newspaper wrote this morning that these elections are no longer the Brexit elections but the central theme is now the terroristic attacks. Um, would you agree with that? Is it um, I wouldn't entirely. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, the, the terror attacks have, have a big impact um, and they're on people's minds. And of course, you never know until people go into the privacy of the ballot paper sure. how, how they really feel about it and what, how they're going to react. But the reason I would, be, I would hesitate about saying that this is now the central theme is because its effect seems to be really quite um, hard to define. Uh, as you saw in that actually very, very good report, um, you would expect that terror attacks would play very strongly for a conservative government, right, which can come out and say, particularly when you, you've got a far left Labour leader who has always opposed you know, most of the anti-terrorist yeah. legislation, they would, you would think he's a pretty soft target and it would, it would suit Theresa May and the Conservatives. However, as, as we saw there, because Theresa May is the person who's been in charge of security for six years, because she has cut very large numbers of police, uh, because she's cut in particular the armed police, because it's an unarmed police force, so the armed police are the ones who actually deal with, with, with violent crime, and particularly with, with terrorism, she's in a very, very weak position yeah. to, to capitalise. So I, I would say, if I were being honest, that nobody knows what the effect of the terror attacks is actually going to be. Um, it's it, it certainly you, you wouldn't look towards someone like Jeremy Corbyn, who's very inexperienced, never held office. You know, he's been a politician for most of mm. his life. He's never held office, so you would see, well, is this the time to have a very inexperienced person like him, or do you say, well, is it better to have no experience in, in Corbyn's case, or to have bad experience, which which May has really, which of, is of handling these issues extremely yeah. poorly. May's come out and said, you know, uh, there's been too much toleration of, of terrorism in recent years. So people are saying, yeah, you, you were the one who was tolerating it then. You're, you, you've been in charge of this. Um, so I think all of this is feeding towards a fundamental question, which is, even goes beyond both Brexit and, and terrorism, but underlies both of them, which is authority. What you're getting is a vacuum of authority emerging in, in, in the UK. Um, whoever wins this election 
It's very unlikely to answer the basic question about who's in charge here, who do we trust, uh, who is actually going to be in a position to face the, the enormous challenges that, that, that Felix outlined so, so eloquently. Um, so it, it seems to me quite likely that the election will resolve far less than we thought even two or three weeks ago. Yeah, because in France, Felix, you had the, the whole idea of one man or woman faces the nation. Um, how do you see that working out in Britain? Do you agree with Finton on the idea that authority is what people will vote for? Yeah, I think one thing that's sort of easy to understand and, and which I think uh, Corbyn is hammering home in a very strong way is that there were cuts to the police mm -hmm. and now we're not as safe as we were before. This is not something people have to think about very deeply about policy or anything. Uh, you can go around and say, oh, she cut the police and now three terrorist attacks happened. Yeah. So when we talk about authority, I think May has lost lots of it in, uh, over the duration of the campaign, but maybe especially uh, in this subject, in this, in this sort of area of, of politics. So what we're seeing, I think, is an extraordinary reversal of what usually happens. Uh, as Finton says, uh, defense and security is really a realm where the conservatives do well. And this time around, perhaps people will vote Labour on those very issues. Yeah. Um, so when, it's a very muddled story when we come to talk about authority and who we vote for, yes or no. Yeah. If we turn to May, because in the end she wants to uh, minimize the talking points towards her Brexit uh, um, um, key uh, reason to hold the election. Um, how is she doing so far in the sense that um, she didn't have to call these elections? She did. Now she's on the route for her Brexit strategy. Yeah. Where is she right now? Uh, <laughs> um, up the creek without a paddle, I think, is where she is. Um, so I think if you stand back from this, you, you have to think about if you're, going to, if you're going to run an election about an issue, right, you have to have a narrative. Right? It's, a, it's pretty basic stuff. right? I, anybody will tell you an election campaign is a story. You tell a story. And, and whoever has the most convincing story is, is probably going to win the election. And the story is Brexit, but it's, it's a story without a plot. So uh, the underlying weakness I is that, um, I mean, precisely for all the reasons Felix was talking about, um, I mean, Brexit is something that Theresa May doesn't believe in. Almost the entire British Civil Service doesn't believe in. She was a Remainer, right? She was a Remainer. Yeah. I mean, you know, she, she, she was in the Home Office. And one of the things she said, of course, was that pulling out of Europe would be disastrous for British security. A security cooperation was so, was so enormously important. So um, she then found herself um, threatening, I mean, before these terrorist attacks, she was threatening as a bargaining chip in, in the Brexit negotiations that Britain would withdraw security cooperation from the rest of mm. Europe. I mean, in, 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 intensely insane stuff. So. The Brexit narrative doesn't work. It doesn't work at any level. Right? There, there is no story there. There's not even a story about, well, we went and we had a referendum and we got a mandate. Because what was the mandate for? Nobody knows. It, it was a negative mandate. It was, we're fed up, we're angry, we're going to kick those people, um, and we kick them and we hurt our own toe. Um, and then what, what do we do? Um, the ideology of Brexit is not an ideology, it's a tautology. You know, Brexit means Brexit. Well, you know, thanks a lot, that's great. Uh, there, there's absolutely no detail, there's no sense of strategy, there's no sense of what the bottom line is. The least you would have expected out of an election was that May was going to come out and say, look, I'm calling this election because this is my strategy for Brexit. This is the bottom line, this is what we want to achieve. This is what it's going to look like. And I'm asking you to back me. I'm asking for that mandate. And I'm then going to go to Brussels and argue for that mandate. I'm going to say the British people have backed me. This is what I want. But, 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 are, you then but are you then saying she called an election about Brexit but never talked about it? Exactly. So there is okay. not a single scintilla more clarity about what May means by Brexit, what she wants from Brexit, what she really believes is achievable from Brexit yeah. than there was at the, at, at the beginning of the election. At the same time, Felix, um, it struck me as odd that I think 49% voted to stay in Europe. Yeah. At the same time, the Liberal Democrats are third, and are, and are um, Labour is against uh, um, Labour wants the Brexit. The Conservatives want want, want the Brexit. The Liberal Democrats don't, but still they don't seem to capitalise on it in the election. How do you explain that? Yeah, th this in a sense is the great question of the election: where are the Liberal Democrats and where is the Progressive Centre uh, in Britain? I think. One way to explain it, 
is that the Lib Dems just don't have enough power in British electoral politics to have their voices heard. The other explanation, I think, is, uh, has to do more so with Tim Farron, who I think, if you close your eyes, says really good stuff. But when you see him on stage, his charisma is just not enough to bring the message to the people. But Theresa May's charisma is not overwhelming yes, but either, she's right? starting from a different basis, okay. and she's lost lots okay. of points because of it, because yeah. she's weak and wobbly and, and all of those things. But Tim Farron was in a place to take the country to a different opinion on Brexit, and in a way he squandered it or he wasn't really given the opportunity because first he had to talk about gay sex and what he thought about that because of his faith and then after that he didn't really get the opportunity to talk about Brexit because Theresa May doesn't talk about Brexit and of course Corbyn doesn't talk about yeah. Brexit either. So what was meant to be a Brexit election really hasn't been about Brexit whatsoever and that's left the Liberals in a really tough place I think. Yeah. Well, one thing worth saying though is that what, th there is something significant has happened over the last week which is that I mean, we've been saying that Labour is against Brexit, or is in favour of Brexit. Mm. Yeah. It's not really. I mean, what, what, what Labour's done, uh, I mean, Corbyn was extremely weak on the whole subject. He was terrible during the referendum campaign. He tried to avoid the subject. But actually, he's realised, and one, it's one of the reasons he's doing well in the last week, that Labour actually can get away with having a distinctive position. And has articulated in the last couple of days, not very loudly and not very well, but has been absolutely clear about the fact that Labour if they win the election, we'll look for a soft Brexit. We'll look to remain in the, in the single market. We'll look to remain within the customs union. Now that's very significant. Uh, it, it does mean that actually for the Remainers, there is now a, a, a strategic sense that you might not want to vote for Corbyn for all sorts of reasons, but actually if you want a soft Brexit, you have to vote Labour. Yeah. Um, because a Labour government would negotiate in an entirely different way would, you know, I mean, so Corbyn came out very clearly and said, look, a hard Brexit will be a disaster for British industry. The people we represent, the, the workers, the trade unions, you know, are going to suffer really appallingly. Poverty is going to rise. Child poverty is going to rise. We can't have that. We have to avoid that. So they're starting from a very different rhetorical base. Yeah. And also, strategically, they're laying out a very different kind of approach but, to it. But still, the bullet of Brexit has been fired. Um, yeah. Whomever wins, Labour or uh, the Conservatives, how much steering room is there? to choose for a soft and hard Brexit? Because at the same time, you said, um, try competing with a bloc that's seven times as big as you are. H how, how do you look at that? Well, look, there's enormous room. Uh, it, 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 if Labour were to win the election, I, I don't think they will. But if they were, it would be, it would be seismic. You know, it would be almost as seismic as Brexit itself, because it was just as unexpected. Hmm. Right? And what it shows is that actually this game is still far from over. That actually you've got, a, what, which, which I think is the case, you've got a very, very, very volatile Britain. You've got a place which doesn't know what its identity is, doesn't even know what the United Kingdom is anymore. The United Kingdom, as we're going, will not exist in 10 years' time. I can, I can tell you that. Right? It, there will not be a United Kingdom. So b Brexit threatens the very existence of the state. You know, it's, it's that fundamental. And yes, these, are, these things are not being properly articulated. They're not being examined in the kind of detail that they should be. But they're there. And if Labour were to win, or even come very close to winning, and some polls put them 1% behind, uh, I don't quite believe that myself, mm. but, but it, who knows. If, they, if, if Labour does very well, what it will show you is that there's a really fundamental lack of resolution in British politics. It's, it's completely open. And therefore, because it's completely open, when, let's say, Theresa May wins and she comes back with a dreadful deal, that's going to be an appalling deal. It's still quite open that it, 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 there will be a reaction where people will say, look, that's not what we wanted. That's not what we voted for. We were told, you know, that what, and you, stupid as it seems, a lot of people believe the Boris Johnson line, which we will have our cake and eat it. We will leave the European Union and we will have all of the advantages of being in the European Union. The morning after the Brexit vote, Boris Johnson wrote in the Daily Tele Telegraph, don't worry about this at all. You will still be able to go, you will have free access to live in Europe if you want to live in Europe. You can work in Europe if you want to work in Europe. Your kids can go to university in, in Europe if they want to go. So, I, mean, you know, I mean, at one point earlier in the campaign, Boris Johnson, it became clear that he actually thought Britain would still have a seat on the European Commission after leaving the European Union. Yeah. I'm not kidding you. you know, so there's an extraordinary stupidity and naivete behind a lot of the Brexit stuff. And this is why I don't believe it's over, because, I mean, as, as you were saying, I mean, quoting Obama, you know, reality does have to intrude at some point. People have to start at some point re realizing what is the deal. 
May's answer to this all through the election campaign has been no deal is better than a bad deal. This is the other mantra. Brexit means Brexit and no deal is better than a bad deal. But no deal is impossible. There cannot be no deal for a modern society which wishes to trade at all. I mean, yeah. you cannot trade with anybody unless you have a deal. Yeah. You can't fly the air the aircraft. I mean, the biggest airline in, in Europe is an Irish airline called Ryanair. Ryanair announced last week that as of now, they're stopping planning flights from Britain next year. I mean, this is, a, this is actually happening. Why? Because if there is a hard Brexit, if they pull out without a deal, it means British aircraft cannot fly to Amsterdam. You know, why is that? That's governed by the Open Skies Agreements, which is a European Union treaty. Yeah. You know, you, the, you, the, the, like the, the, the idea of no deal is just absurd. I mean, but it's absolutely ludicrous stuff. And this is becoming, it's not clear to people, but it's there in the back of people's minds. And I think it means that this is all still very malleable. It's why this election is so strange, so uncertain, and why it will resolve nothing. Yeah. The outcomes are not going to be clear one, one way or the other. I but but I, I'm going to go to that woman for a question. But first, I, I, I want, lastly, because afterwards people are going to say to me, okay, I like this Finton guy, but he was a bit uh, with a doom scenario, <laughs> saying that if Brexit continues, the um, United Kingdom will fall apart. And is this really, um, how much of that is a warning against <laughs> things that can happen and can still change? And what do you see is really a, like an organic thing we can't stop or is inevitable? I, I, I don't see it as inevitable at all. I, I, I think, um, look, What's happening in Britain at the moment is a fetishization of a moment in time. Uh, Brexit is a profoundly anti-historical act, right? It pretends history doesn't exist. It pretends that Britain is still really has an empire, uh, that you know, the European Union has never really happened, and that you can just kind of reverse time. You can just go back to before the European Union. And being profoundly anti-historical, it uh, has then fetishized this idea that we had a vote you know, a year ago, that was the vote, that was the moment in time, and then nothing can be changed. History stops there. And this is nonsense. I mean, the world is not like that. Democracy is not like that. Politics is not like that. People have second thoughts. People change their minds. We in Ireland have twice voted down European treaties. We, we voted against um, Maastricht and we voted against Lisbon. And then we changed our minds and we, you know, we said, ah, okay, yeah, that doesn't, it's kind of a bit awkward that we did that. Let's think about it again and go back and vote differently. And you see, it's perfectly possible to do this. Um, and it, it will be possible if there's political instability, which there will be. And when it becomes clear to people that the deal is a dreadful deal, when, you know, when, when, when prices are rising as they are already, when jobs are being lost, yeah. you know, when, when the reality of this starts to hit people, um, of course it's open to a democratic polity. You know, to, to, to change its mind. Yeah, there's a question. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, my name is Anushka Schut. Um, for politics, I've been in the UK a lot, and I've lived there for nine years, and uh, I come there regularly. And uh, I don't agree with you that the uh, the deal can be changed because it could have been changed if the elections would be there before the Article uh, five, 50 yeah. letter. But now that's there, so that's a fact on its own. Um, um, but yeah, we're talking here tonight about uh, why the elections are there, and is it not more the case that Theresa May, as you just mentioned, um, is uh, ambiguous uh, about uh, about the Brexit, and that she just has lots of internal struggles in the Conservative Party, and that's why she had to call the elections. Yeah. They're saying she needs to shut down the Eurosceptics yeah, by getting because, a broader mandate. Because yeah. there's nothing to be won with the elections, because actually also from Brussels everyone says, well, it actually delays all the negotiations yeah. and you have such a short period of time for the negotiations. And if you, if you speak to people in, Brussels, in, in the UK, they say, well, if we don't have a deal, we want, to have the key, eh, we want to have the cake and eat it, and we want to pay for independence, and that's yeah. our first uh, thing. But if we, if we don't have a deal, we just go back to WTO rules, but yeah, they ignore the fact that the UK doesn't have a membership yeah. of, of the, the uh, WTO. So can you just uh, uh, react to that? And if to the internal like strife yeah. of May in the party. Yeah. 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 
Um, so I, I think you're absolutely right, of course, that th this, this, this election in Newfoundland was completely unnecessary, right? She had a functioning majority in Parliament. She had a very, very weak opposition. You know, the Labour Party, you know, as, as Felix was saying earlier, was in complete disarray. She had more power than any British Prime Minister really has had for a very, very long time. Um, and she called the election um, partly out of egotism. You know, she thought she would get a historically large majority for a Conservative Prime Minister. And partly to give herself room to manoeuvre. So she thought, OK, I'm going to have a majority of maybe 200, 250 seats. Uh, and therefore, whatever deal comes out, I can get it through. Because even if I lose some people, I'll be fine. The problem with that is that, in fact, in order to get this majority, what she's done is she's made the uh, Conservative Party into UKIP. So you know, the reason that the Tories are doing well at the polls is they've taken the UKIP vote. She's pushing Farage's agenda. Yeah. yeah. So she's become Farage, right? Um, but, but that obviates against the whole, if there was a strategy of saying, let's try and do a deal, let's get a mandate for a deal. Because the only mandate she would have in that case is a mandate for a hard Brexit. And the key question then is, um, I think you're actually right legally, by the way. Of course, Article 50 has been triggered. And of course, legally, the logic is they can't go back. I don't quite believe it. And the reason I don't believe it is because the European Union is a very pragmatic institution in the end. If, if the British came out in, in two years' time and said, look, we've negotiated, we've tried to get the best deal, we're going to put it to another referendum, uh, or have another general election on us, maybe, you know, and the result is the British say, actually, we prefer to stay in the European Union, I don't believe under those circumstances that the European Union would not allow the British to go back to the status quo ante. Um, maybe with some uh, new conditions, but, but you know, I, I still think a deal would be done. Yeah. Uh, Felix? Uh, uh, yeah. I, th I think there's a third reason. I think you're right that there maybe wasn't much to win, but there was something not to lose, which is that if she had to call the regular election within the regular period of time, it would have been just after she yeah. got back from Brussels and just after that two-year period. It would have become clear that the deal that she came back with, if there was a deal at that time, was horrendous, that the economy had been tanking, and that she would have possibly lost that election. So I think she bought herself an extra couple of years by calling it now and thinking that this would be a safe one. Yeah. Right, so that, I think that's I a think third that's element a very, there. That's a very yeah. good point, but of course it may work out exactly the opposite. Exa yeah, that it was she risky. She could have a minority government. Um, how could a minority government negotiate with Brussels? I, I simply don't know. Yeah. But in that sense, what maybe you can enlighten me. We've had David Cameron calling for a referendum in the idea of that they would vote remain and he could remain as prime minister. Then we have uh, Theresa May who calls an election and says, I'm going to win this, or at least that's her expectation. I'm going to win this big and I'm going to have a broader mandate. Um, who's, the, who's the advisor of the Conservative <laughs> Party and how does this... It's, it's a brilliant question. I think. It's, a, no, it's a really very good question because if you if you stand back from this, right, the Conservative Party of, in, in in England, well in Britain as a whole, uh, for, at one point, is one of the most successful political parties in world history. Right? It's yeah. it's, it's held power for much more ma mo many more years than it's been out of office. Uh, it's been there for a very long time. It's a very stable political entity, and yet it completely lost its nerve. It's lost its nerve now th three times, in fact, right? which was it, just, just in the last two years. First of all, Cameron calling a referendum was a complete loss of nerve, complete loss of his own authority. Um, secondly, it's uh, lost its nerve, and this is the one that's less obvious, but by then choosing to interpret the election result in the most extreme possible way, without any mandate for it. Why? Because it's simply afraid of UKIP and afraid of the Tory press, the Daily Mail and the Sun. Daily Mail in particular, for in, in, in May's case, the second loss of nerve. And then a third loss of nerve is the election itself. So failing to actually carry through what she yeah. said she was going to do, which was not call it kind of election, go but, on and negotiate. But then how do you explain it? Is it just so, UKIP and the Daily yeah, Mail? No. So well, it's, it's partly, so you, you can never forget the role of the British press. Uh, it, it is unique. I mean, I spent a lot of time in America. There's a pretty horrific press there. <laughs> it's pretty, I'm sure you've got some horrible newspapers in the Netherlands. We've got some pretty horrible ones. Around. You've nothing like the British press. I mean, it's, it really is extraordinary in its viciousness, its propagandistic nature, and it's deeply rooted. It's, it's as if you had Fox News there for 30, 40 years, rather than just as a, as a, as a new kind of phenomenon. So the British press, that, that Tory press, is, is, is ferocious. It's utterly ideological. 
and it's completely deluded, right? So it, 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 they genuinely believe it's going to be Nirvana. You know, Britain is going to be liberated. It's going to do all these fantastic trade deals in two years. Uh, by the way, David Davis, who is in charge of Brexit, said within two years of the Brexit vote, not of actually uh, triggering it or negotiating the way out of the European Union, they were going to have more trade deals with more countries um, fully negotiated than they, than they already had at the European Union. I mean, it's complete insanity. It's illusional stuff, right? So, but they're driven. They're, the press is, is, is driving that. That's a big factor. But there's, there's two big underlying factors, and I, I'll, I'll try and just say these very, very briefly. One is that nobody talks about, but it's, it's there, and it's English nationalism. So there's a deep-lying problem for Britain, which is that uh, English nationalism has always been there. Quite legitimately. I mean, every, every country has a degree of nationalism. There's nothing in itself wrong with nationalism, right? I'm an Irish nationalist, I suppose, if you want to, you know, I'm sure you're a Dutch nationalist in, in a sense. You know, with you, football. You, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, exactly. You have an expression of loyalty to your own country, right? The problem is, English nationalism is very powerful, but it's always been sublimated into two other entities. One was the empire, and the other was Britain itself, this idea of Britishness. As the idea of uh, the empire is gone, uh, and then Britishness is falling apart, right? With the rise of Scottish nationalism in particular, with developments in Northern Ireland, the idea of the UK is, is very, very much um, problematic. So English nationalism is emerging. And UKIP, and in a way the whole Brexit thing is an expression of an English nationalism. Again, I said nothing in, in, in principle wrong with that. It's just that it's a completely incoherent, inchoate, unexpressed, inarticulate nationalism. It doesn't have a sense of what it wants or where it's going. So this force has been unleashed. And it's there in the Conservative Party. It affects them very, very profoundly. And they don't know what to do with it. Mm. They have no idea how to articulate it or how to direct it in some kind of useful or yeah. progressive way. The, and, and, the, and the second factor, just to say it, is of course the crisis of capitalism, folks. We don't talk about it. You know, the, the, the crash of, of 2008 is a fundamental crisis in finance capitalism, in a particular model of capitalism. The kind of inequalities, the, the kinds of, 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 of uh, uh, profound loss of faith in the future for so many people in, in our societies, yeah. um, of course, is having an effect. Britain is locked into permanent austerity. Yeah. And that's having a really very profound effect for the Conservative Party, because the Conservative Party has been successful historically because it's been able to at least are, you know, articulate a sense of one nation, a sense of we're all in it together, a sense that actually you know, we're, we're a kind of patrician party. We yeah. have a paternalistic uh, concern for the weak. And May tried to articulate this. I mean, her whole you know, way of uh, addressing things is, uh, I'm the mother of the nation. I care about everybody. Yeah. Um, I, I care about the people who are just about managing. But, and, but you can't articulate that with the kind of austerity that's been going yeah. on. So. I want to go to Felix, but first, because you make the bridge yourself, you wrote... Um, this morning, I think, um, about this concept of nostalgia. Because if, you, if I hear you talk, um, you could also say that uh, Labour and Jeremy Corbyn also um, has an austerity agenda and, and tries to cope with the question of capitalism in, in, in his own different way. Um, what did you mean by saying that May and Corbyn both aim for nostalgia? Yeah, so the, the, the common thing that's said about Jeremy Corbyn uh, and his sort of left Labour um, position is that it's sort of nostalgic for the 1970s, right? I mean, mm. it's, it's sort of pretending that you can go back to the sort of high points of social democracy. Um, and there's a certain truth in that. Um, but I was trying to make the point that, that actually that, that critique of, of Corbyn, even though it has some truth, um, leaves out the fact that May is actually much more nostalgic. You know, she's not even nostalgic for the 1970s, she's nostalgic for the 1950s. You know, what May talks about, her, her whole um, selling point is, I, am, I grew up in a vicarage in the south of England in the 1950s, and the world was wonderful, you know, and we had benevolent values and benevolent views of everybody, and a kind of English benevolence radiated out from us, you know, and England was just a lovely place, and we can somehow go back to that, you know, after Brexit, that we'll go back to this kind of kind of England, and she expresses it in terms of things like, um, you know, the schooling system will go back to what it was like when she was a girl, or, you know, uh, the, 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 a lot of the people around her talk about after Brexit you will have Empire 2.0, you know, <laughs> this kind of insane attraction towards a sort of a very nostalgic view of Englishness, which, you know, neglects the fact that England is actually a very divided society, it's a very multicultural society, it's a, it's a society in all sorts of flux. So, 
she thought that by kind of selling this vision of a sort of nostalgic England, that it would just sweep the boards. And actually, the interesting thing that's happened in the election is that people are saying, yeah, but my, my local hospital is a nightmare. Um, my kid's school is falling apart. The, the police aren't there anymore. The police station is closed. I mean, how, how am I getting nostalgia when you know, the, the present is, 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 is so difficult? So I was, I was trying to point out that I think some of the critique of, of Corbyn is slightly unfair. Um, because actually what transformed the election, and we all say you know, people don't read party political manifestos anymore and ideas don't matter anymore. Well, Labour was 25 points behind. They produced actually a very coherent social democratic manifesto. Um, you could critique it, but it was a coherent, yeah. well put together, well costed, well stated manifesto, and it changed the election. Because a lot of people started saying, actually, that, you know, I do want the railways to be renationalised. They've been a disaster. I want the water services to be renationalised. I want investment in, in health and education and housing. Um, so, the, you know, Labour actually discovered a kind of coherent story. You could critique that story and say, how can you really apply that fully in our global? I think Blair called it an Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, but but it doesn't feel like that for someone who's, who's yeah. just going to hospital and really just wants you know wants it wants a health service. So, yeah. You know that, that it's an anti-austerity agenda, absolutely. But but you know Blair Blair bears a, a great deal of responsibility for destroying the Labour Party by tying it into a sort of neoliberal yeah. agenda. You know? Well, I find it interesting, Felix, because, okay, you can't draw the comparison too big, but in the Netherlands we have the Social Democrats, and they also shrugged off their ideological feathers, maybe in the same way that Blair pushed a sort of third way, which is a bit uh, loose from the whole leftist tradition. How do you see Corbyn, um, well, he he doesn't seem to be crushed this election. He seems to bounce back. How do you explain that? Is that just a manifesto? Sure, yeah. It's a, it's a sharper economic message than what a lot of other sort of left-leaning or centrist politicians have been putting forward, including Hillary Clinton in the campaign against Trump. And it's a coherent narrative in that sense. And it's something that's cutting through to people. And can you say, sure, I, I mean, this is an impossible question, so excuse me. Yeah. But, the, <laughs> but the main topics usually in an, um, in an election are security, yeah. Um, economy and identity. Mm -hmm. What are his answers to that? So I think w the main answer he tries to provide is economy and inequality. And this is the heart of the success of his campaign. Because May only wants to talk about her general leadership style and getting the power and then doing with it what, sh what she would want to do. I think Corbyn is addressing the very problems that got us here. He's talking about inequality and how to address it. That's something that people appreciate, I think. Mm. So that's, uh, you know, even if he doesn't win, I think you wrote this, even if he doesn't win the election, he'll win the campaign. He's done very well in talking about issues that we need to talk about in the 21st century. We've had 40 years of a shrinking middle class, mostly in the Anglo-Saxon world, not so much in the continent of Europe, and that needs to be addressed. And has he, in that sense, um, strengthened his position in Labour? Because Labour was quite divided under his leadership for the last years. How do yeah. you see that now? I think there's something tragic about this because he has. He has strengthened his grip on labor. He has made it a more left-wing party than it was before. I think a lot of people would say that labor can talk to a lot of its core constituencies but may not be able to win a national election in this way. That's not something that people who support the middle or the center left would want as an outcome. So what I think is interesting, what might happen as a result of this, as a more left-wing Labour Party, and arguably a more right-wing and a more left-wing conservative party at the same time, that some of these elements of these parties will break off and form a more progressive center. I think The Economist was right to point out in its endorsement of the Liberal Democrats that that's what Britain is missing, a sort of center, radical, progressive politics that existed at the beginning of the 20th century incidentally under Winston Churchill's leadership when they were still the liberals, yeah. right? A kind of social liberalism that takes an open view of the world that is internationalist, pro-European in outlook, and it's, that would actually speak to the largest segment Macron, of British actually. voters, a Macron-like politics, yes. yes. Just to finish off the round, and maybe there are some questions in the audience after that, um, we haven't spoken yet about UKIP or the Greens, for example. Oh. Yeah. Um, is UKIP a factor in these elections? 
Um, it's a negative factor in the sense that the, the evidence, at least so far, suggests that you, the UKIP vote's going to the Tories. Um, and that could win the Tories a lot of seats. I mean, it was a very good explanation of this kind of crazy first-past-the-post system. So even if UKIP only had 4 or 5% of the votes in some of those constituencies, if the Tories get the bulk of that vote, they win. it could make a big difference. Um, however, what's, what's, what's actually become quite interesting is that uh, six months ago, if we were having this discussion, most people probably would have said that the real story of the selection is going to be UKIP winning a whole lot of Labour seats in the north of England. Why? Because those constituencies voted for Brexit, uh, even though Labour was telling them not to. Um, and immigration is uh, apparently a very big issue, and there's a lot of uh, passion around all of that. Labour seemed extraordinarily vulnerable to UKIP. So although um, the Tories will win seats because of they're taking some of the UKIP vote, the evidence so far is that Labour is holding those working class, traditional urban bases in the north of England. And that's very significant because it means that UKIP will almost certainly cease to be an electoral force. Um, it means that whatever happens in the election, Labour will remain a viable political party. And uh, that then means, at the very least, that there is a viable political party which is committed to a soft Brexit <laughs> and which will be energised. Um, like, it's very hard from outside to realise. I mean, Jeremy Corbyn was a joke figure three months ago, two months ago. I mean, his own party, every, I mean, you know, almost every single one of his members of parliament thought he was dreadful, you know, that they would be slaughtered in the election. They would, they would, they, there were people seriously saying Labour will have less than 100 seats, you know. It's just going to be an absolute disaster. It's going to be wiped out under Corbyn. And actually, and I have to admit, I was one of those people. I mean, Corbyn has actually had a very good election campaign. So, so he's been very calm. He's been very articulate. He's, been, he's looked avuncular rather than this kind of mad Trotskyite, which he probably is. <laughs> um, you know, he's just looked like your nice uncle. Um, he's been kind of honest and straightforward. When he's made mistakes, I mean, somebody really has talked to him. So, he, he did one really dreadful interview in which he was asked about certain statistics and figures and he didn't know them. And it was, like, it was a kind of car crash thing. And then uh, you know, he just came out straight away and said, I'm really sorry. You know, I, I should have had those figures. I didn't have the figures. These are the figures and I should have had them. And you know, it's just what well, actually... And he could rub it off. Just what a human being would do rather yeah. than a politician, right? And, and it sort of really worked. So he's had a terrific election campaign. And it means on one side that Labour are stuck with him. He's going nowhere. I mean, even if he loses the election... He will almost certainly get more votes than Ed Miliband, the last Labour leader got. Nobody mm. would ever have thought that. Yeah. Um, he may even get more votes than Gordon Brown got. So um, something very interesting has happened in that that sort of old-fashioned social democratic um, policy, which has cohered around Corbyn, it's not so much that Corbyn has created it, mm. it's that he's, he's created the space for it. And he's looked like somebody who's learning. So he, he looks like a different person now than he looks even six weeks ago. He's changed his tone. He's changed his strategy. He's talking about Brexit a bit. He's even getting some courage to talk about that. So it's going to create a very interesting situation um, where the balance of authority has shifted. If May is the prime minister, she's going to be a much weaker prime minister than she was. Yeah, because, because the maybe before we go yeah. to the answer, then the um, last speculative question. Um, May is going to win with a really small margin. Well, you, you pointed, out, pointed out during dinner that usually the day after they're presenting the new government. What's going to happen then? Is she going to be the prime minister? I mean, if I had to put money on it, I wouldn't like to put money on it, I'd say she mm. will be the prime minister. I'd say she'll have a working majority, probably. But her, her authority, her, the Theresa May myth is just gone. Yeah. It's, it's, just, it's, it's not recoverable. She can't get that back. And her problem is then that um, everybody on the other side of the table in, in, in Brussels has been watching her. Right? Yeah. And what they've seen is that her whole shtick, you know, I am strong and stable, I say what I mean, I mean what I say, I stick to my guns, that's all just gone. You know, she's, she's done so many U-turns. She has done extraordinary things like not turning up for the main television debate. I mean, she didn't debate the other parties. She called an election and refused to debate. I mean, she just looks incredibly weak. She has no authority. And then what happens is she goes in and she tries to get a deal. Yeah, because she wants to be the lead negotiator, right? Yeah. So I think, actually, the weakness of May will probably make a hard Brexit more likely. This, this is paradoxical. But I think you're in that strange situation in England where the, the path of least resistance, with the, particularly with the Tory press, is the most extreme path. 
Um, and so I, I think the chances of a car crash Brexit of actually walking away with nothing are, are, are probably going to be enhanced. However, on the other side, if you still have a viable opposition, which you did not have six weeks ago, six weeks ago you did not have a viable political opposition in Britain, you will have it now. And I think you will have people emboldened in the Labour Party start talking about, well, actually, the deal May is doing is dreadful. Let's rethink this. Yeah. Let's have another parliamentary vote. Let's have another election. Let's have another, another referendum. Let's try to find some way out of this disaster. So I, that's why I don't think this story is over yet at all. Yeah. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes. First you, and then I come to you. Thank you very much. I'll keep it. Oh, you're going to hold it. Uh, I'm Steve Lawrence. Uh, I'm uh, British, but I live here in uh, Amsterdam, and I also live in London at the same time. So I've got a foot in each camp. Um, and I've got two areas of question. One, I want to come back to something you were just talking about, and the other is a, a sort of fresh area. Um, and it's to do with the legal situation to do with triggering Article 50. There are two legal cases stored up at the moment that I know of. Um, one is to actually challenge um, the, the, the triggering on the basis that there's been no substantive vote in Parliament to actually leave the European Union so that actually the triggering is on a false premise in the first place. Yeah. Um, and the second um, is looking to the repeal of the European Communities Act and is waiting to see what happens there and to, um, and to create a fresh challenge in the court. So there's two potential um, uh, initially into, um, high court cases and then they'll be appealed to the Supreme Court and that will hold things up. Um, so I'm interested to know what, uh, what you have to say about that. Um, Sh shall we first start with that and then you do the second part? After it, or is it really? It's well. It's very. It's very different. And you'll. I, why don't I just say it? it it's to do with the um, reciprocity, um, and you haven't touched on this at all. And um, the the European Union, or at least the the European Council, have said that one, the, the the issues that will be dealt with first are the rights of um, EU citizens in the UK and the rights of UK citizens in the EU, and that's been talked about in the context of bargaining chips. Now. Um, in, in fact, um, this, this isn't reciprocal at all because European Union citizens will always retain their European citizenship rights, whereas U UK citizens will lose their Euro European citizenship rights. So, so it can't be re reciprocal. It's actually impossible. So I just wondered if you'd like to explore that a little bit too. So those are the yeah. two areas. Okay. Two, two points. Um, those are both excellent points, and um, I, I suspect uh, from the very eloquent way you put them that you know much more about both of them than I do. <laughs> so I'm not going to pretend uh, that, that I have your expertise in them. Um, I think you're absolutely right about the legal cases, I, I, and I think it, it seems to me that there's still even doubt about whether or not Article 50 is reversible. Um, I know there's a legal case being taken in the Dublin courts in relation to this. Um, to have it referred to the European courts, of course. Um, has it been withdrawn, right? So uh, maybe, and is that, is that because there's no basis for it? Because I know the person who drafted it, who was English, felt that there was doubt about the legal stuff. So, yeah. Um, and actually, I think it's in, within the last few days, mm. and it's because the, um, he had counted on the Irish government supporting it, yeah. and um, it seems that they're yeah. not prepared yeah. to. Yeah. Um, but, but I mean, all I would say about it is that uh, it, 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 it does seem to me to be perfectly plausible to say that the legal game is by no means over. Um, and what's going to be very interesting then is not that in isolation, it's how that will play into an unstable political situation. Um, and, and how that's going to be perhaps used to create space to say, let's have some kind of process of rethinking. Particularly if you were to have, for example, a minority government emerging out of the elections, which is not the most likely possibility, but not impossible by any means. And the second area? Uh, on the second area, in terms of reciprocity, um, again, I think you've articulated that extremely well. I think it's, so the, the three areas of priority that the European um, Commission and Parliament have, have laid down, so it has to be dealt with first, are people, money, and Ireland. And in each of those areas, the European Union position is vastly more um, sophisticated and elaborated, and also, of course, stronger than the UK position. 
Um, so you're absolutely right in, in, in terms of people. I, I, I don't even get a sense that there's an understanding of the issues for UK citizens in the European Union, never mind a clear sense of what it is that needs to be achieved out of this. The discourse in Britain, I'm sure you've seen it because you're there, is very much about you know, how we're going to be nice to the Europeans in, who are already in Britain. I've seen almost no serious discussion of the position of UK citizens within the, within the European Union. On the issue of money, obviously there's a game being played there, there's, there's a lot of bargaining uh, going on or pre-bargaining going on. Um, but again, I think there's a kind of delusional discourse where there's a sense that, oh, you know, we can walk away without paying anything, or if we pay anything, it'll be pretty small. And on the issue of Ireland, um, the, the European Union has a pretty sophisticated position in relation to this. The UK government has no position whatsoever, except saying, don't worry, it'll all be fine. Um, and yeah. so the, the political question then is, at, at what point do these things become real? At what, what point do people begin to realise that this is actually not a game? And these are only the preliminary questions. These are only the first three questions you have to talk about before you even talk about trade or you talk about the, the much more difficult and substantive issues around what the, what the ultimate relationships are. Um, and this is why, uh, maybe I'm myself delusional, but <laughs> I, I don't believe that any sophisticated modern democracy, and whatever we think about the UK is still a sophisticated modern democracy, is capable of getting itself ultimately to a position where it becomes so delusional that, that issue after issue after issue is simply ignored. <laughs> and as you simply, simply keep saying, it doesn't matter, it's all going to be okay. You know, there has to be an adult discourse at some point, and there has to be then a way in which this can happen. What's lacking at the moment is that there isn't a polity in which it's happening. Parliament's completely, um, you know, in, in my view from the outside, if this was about parliamentary sovereignty, you know, and, and Parliament really failed to exert its most basic duties of, of, of fully scrutinising this, of voting on it. I mean, why did Parliament even vote to have this election? You know, there was a fixed Parliament Act, they didn't have to do it. It required the, the opposition to, 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 to go along with this. I mean, why was there no challenge to the idea that, you know, that this was okay? Um, there's been a, a really very profound weakness in British democracy. Um, but I, I don't give up on the idea that it can be recovered and that sort of normal democratic processes can kick in again. Yeah, there is a question here. Hi, yeah, also a Brit living in Amsterdam. Um, obviously, I've already voted. Uh, I voted Lib Dem, um, casting my vote basically into the sea because I, I vote in Jeremy Corbyn's constituency. <laughs> so, so. Um, it's a really basic question. It's almost embarrassing to ask, but as an average citizen, um, what can I do to tr to get my voice heard or to to try and stop this? I mean, I'm I just I'm I'm so overwhelmed with the ridiculousness and idiocy of the whole thing, and I have absolutely no idea. I've voted, you know, obviously I voted against Brexit in the first place, and now I just think, well, what can I do? Anything? Well, Finton, save <laughs> us. <laughs> You know, again, I, I, I went to the, um, there was a big convention on Brexit in London a couple of weeks ago, which was a civic initiative, um, and, uh, you know, so it wasn't organised by any of the political parties, people from all, all parties were there, actually, and, and it was very, it was very energised, um, there were lots of really terrific people there, it was packed, uh, you know, huge numbers of people at it. Um, and it seems to me that that constituency does exist. The, the problem, you know, as we've been talking about, is of course, it doesn't have a political representation. You know, it's, um, uh, um, it, it, it seems to me um, that there's a couple of things. One is that uh, I think the reason the 48% has been so weak right, is, is that there's a strategic decision to be made, which is very difficult. Do you continue to say, no Brexit, no Brexit, no Brexit? Or do you say, let's actually regroup and organize around, stay in the single market, try to make the Brexit as soft and ambiguous as possible? Um, my own view is you probably need to strategically say, let's go for soft Brexit. In a way, because soft Brexit will then you know, be, be so complicated that it, it also opens up the point of saying, well, this is so complicated, why not just go back to the status quo, you know? Um, so 
I think what the, the 48% need to do is actually cohere around a single set of demands, which hasn't happened yet. I think the second thing, it, thing is to realize that there are allies. You know, that, that uh, the Irish question, I know, is, is not discussed a lot in, in Britain, but it's really important. And, and the Irish government, for example, is a real friend of British Remainers, right? In that if there's any government on earth which has an absolute interest in Britain not leaving the European Union, it's the Republic of Ireland. You know, it really matters to us, really fundamentally. And we are on the other side of the table, so we have to negotiate against Britain, you know, because we're, we're part of the 26. But we, we can do that in a way which, which, which um, you know, if, if there was any kind of intelligence, the Irish government could really be used as a friend of Britain within this negotiating process. You know, to actually say, look, let's just try to stop the worst stuff happening. Let's try to slow it down. Let's try to put in as many breaks as possible. Let's try to make transition periods as long as possible. Let's try to make things as ambiguous as possible. And I do think the Irish question is also, I mean, you were talking about the legal strategy, but the Irish question is actually a way of doing this because it's so complicated. <laughs> One of these is that um, people in Britain don't necessarily realize this, but um, everybody born in Northern Ireland, which is part of the UK, has an absolute right to be a citizen of the European Union because they have an absolute right to be a citizen of the Republic of Ireland. The Belfast Good Friday Agreement, 1998, registered with the United Nations. It's an international agreement. It's not, you know, it's underpinned by the United States, the European Union, the United Nations. It's a full international treaty. It says that every single person in Northern Ireland has an absolute right to be Irish or British or both, as they may so choose, and that no change in the constitutional status of the United Kingdom will affect this. Right? So it's, it's really, it's there, it's absolutely full. So you already have citizens within the United Kingdom who have an absolute right to retain their European Union citizenship. And I would also, Felix, if you also respond to the question, but yeah. it's also a question of popular base, right? I mean, if somehow the, the, the majority that now voted Brexit turns into uh, more protests of people who want... I mean, politics can be undone in that sense. How do you see that? And also in response to her sure, question. Sure, yeah. I, this is a question that goes to my heart because I worked in field organizing for the Hillary Clinton campaign in the Midwest. And when you ask what can you do aside from vote, I would say become a member of the party if you can. Uh, volunteer if you have the time. Um, call an organizer, organize around specific topics. And there are so many people doing great things, uh, whether it's in the field or you know making phone calls or knocking on doors. This is something that I think my generation is now doing in the United States and here is becoming involved politically because of these sort of earthquake events. And uh, you know I've been thinking a lot about people who tell me I don't care about voting. Politicians are all the same. They're all going to do the same thing anyway. People said this about the choice between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. They say it about the choice between Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn. That's the sort of laziness, the sort of cynicism that I think we need to wipe away from our society. And the only way you can do it is by engaging your friends and by volunteering. Are there any? Yes, I come to you. I have, um, okay, yeah. <laughs> got all the formula, all right. <laughs> I have two questions, but I'll choose because one question is for the both of you, so I'll choose that one. But before that, a remark in response to yours. I've heard this brilliant uh, remark by Nick Clegg uh, about democracy, where he said, uh, democracy is an organized difference of opinion. Uh, it's not the end of difference of opinion. You keep, differ you keep differing. It, otherwise, it's undemocratic. And that's what we're, we're seeing, I think, in uh, the United Kingdom right now, where you see the tyranny of a relatively small majority. It's really sad to see. It's undemocratic. You keep your difference of opinion. Anyway, my question is a long sort of strategic one, uh, which is uh, painful for the Brits among us and the, the ones that have a mild case of anglophilism as most of the Dutch do. Um, aren't we just better off right now without them? And the background of my question is, we have Macron, we have Merkel, we have a historic moment after the German elections. And I, I, I dare to venture this question to two non-Brits. Um, shouldn't we uh, not hope for a reversal for this you know, uh, economic tanking that is about to happen and then you know, look for ways to reverse the whole process, but instead have them crash in the 
hardest possible way uh, and all the while reorganize ourselves uh, along the lines that Macron set out in his, I, I think now famous, Berlin speech in January, where he really gave us a blueprint for the new European Union that seems to be embraced lock, stock and barrel in Berlin. We have a new working Berlin-Paris yeah. axis Let's get behind it. Let's forget about the Brits for a while. So let's change the perspective a bit from the Brits to the European Union. Sir, um, yes, ironically, I think we're better off first without the Brits for a while. And this is where I venture to disagree with you slightly on uh, the utility of a soft Brexit. Because I think, in fact, you might be right that a hard Brexit will lead to a chance for Europe to get to somewhere where we're not at this point. It means us having the ability to strengthen the Eurozone, having the ability to strengthen European defense outside of NATO, and having the, the ability to strengthen European climate policy, to strengthen our common external borders, and then for the British to come back, hopefully, m maybe in a couple decades. I think the British are an essential part of our European civilization, and I want them to be part of the chief political organizing principle of our continent, which happens to be the European Union. Um, so yes, I think this is a chance, and I think you're right to suggest it. It's a great question, um, and I, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm being very selfish about this, right? So I'm looking at it as an Irish person, um, and uh, I think if you were thinking about the European project, there's a very strong case for saying Britain's going to be, whatever, it's, whatever way it's going, it's going to be so chaotic in the sense that you can't hold everything up while Britain sorts out its nervous breakdown, you know, which may take decades of treatment. Um, so, you know, the working out of the breakup of the United Kingdom, I mean, all of those kinds of things which are, which are there, absolutely, I can, I can perfectly see the case for saying let them go. Um, I, I have two problems with that. One is that um, I like British people very much. Uh, I actually uh, like you. I mean, you know, like I'm an Irish nationalist and all that. But you know, Brits are quite nice people, and and there's lots of there's very decent things about British society. You know, enormously admirable things about Britain. Um, it matters historically in Europe, and for all the appalling aspects of British Empire and everything else, I mean, it did stand up to fascism. It, it, it has stood for a certain kind of decency and tolerance and, and moderation in, in, our, in our lives, which really matter. And I'm really, really reluctant to see that destroyed, which I fear it will be as it, as it slips into this chaos. The suffering will be really enormous, I, I'm, I'm afraid, with a hard Brexit. You know, and, and of course, it'll be the suffering of the most vulnerable, the poorest, yeah. the kids, the disabled, the unemployed. Um, and so maybe this part of me just doesn't want to see that. I also, but my, my own country is collateral damage in this, right? So, so while Britain is having its nervous breakdown, um, we are the neighbours who have to sort of listen to the screams. Uh, we, we're very, very profoundly affected by it, and it's very difficult for us to to see how we're going to deal with the Northern Ireland question. Um, a, 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 and with all of the economic um, uh, problems that we have uh, without having to make really very, very difficult choices and I'd rather not have to make them. But I think you're probably right that that's actually the way it is going. Yeah. 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 One yeah. very small yes. practical question sure. on this for you specifically. Nobody has come forward with a plan as to what a soft border would mean, whereas on the one hand we have to deal with the Irish Republic. Yeah. I keep looking for this. I'm deeply concerned about it. Do yeah. you know of any sort of practical, plausible plan to You see, it's, 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 no it's really not possible. I mean, I keep saying, don't worry, it, it will be a very soft border, and you won't even know there. I mean, you just can't do it. If you're out of the single market, out of the customs union, um, you, we all know, I mean, everybody knows, it's not so much the, the customs border post. It's, it's the, you know, the cost for, for just ordinary daily trade is enormous. But also in the political situation, you will have to have some fixed points. And we know in the political situation, those fixed points will become targets for, it's still a small rump of zealots. They're very small politically. But once you start militarizing a border, once they attack, you have to militarize. Once you militarize, it, it has that, yeah. those, those effects. So I, I, I cannot see how the border will be anything but a real imposition. And it, to me, the demand and actually the European Union, to be fair, has come pretty close to saying this, is that actually Northern Ireland should be exempted from Brexit. 
It's a very radical demand. But we're in a very radical situation. And the European Union has done something really quite extraordinary, which I think probably wasn't noticed on most of continental Europe. But in its basic statements of principles in the negotiations, it said, OK, it said uh, people, money, and Ireland are the three fundamentals. And in relation to Ireland, it was explicitly stated by the Council that should Northern Ireland choose to rejoin the Republic in a united Ireland, there will, it will automatically rejoin the European Union. It will not have to negotiate. Right? Now, this to me is really quite historic because I don't think the European Union has ever explicitly offered a part of an existing member state an incentive to leave that member state. And if you think about Spain, if you think about all the kind of potential complications of this, it's a very radical gesture on the part of the European Union. And so far, the European Union has been um, you know, as sympathetic to Ireland as you could possibly want, I have to say. Um, the way they've articulated it, it, it seems very serious. Barnier has, has spoken very eloquently about it. So we may end up with a very radical kind of solution, which says the border will actually be between the island of Ireland and, and the UK. And why not? Let, let's have ambiguous, open yeah. solutions, you know, which are flexible, which, which don't necessarily tie everything up with, with, with ribbons. We've been talking now for one and a half hours, so I think it maybe it's good to have two more questions if they're there. But first, Felix, um, in, in addition to the question, we are talking about is Europe better off with the Brits leaving, but is the Netherlands? Because the Netherlands liked to be between well, the knees of uh, France, or, or of Germany, and the Brits. That they could call the Brits if they wanted something to be done, and they could call the Germans. What does it mean for the Netherlands? In it's Europe? ambiguous because I think the Dutch national interest, uh, as I said before, is synonymous, uh, the same with Germany, with the European uh, mm. uh, interest. So we have an interest in holding on to our trade with Britain, which is the one instrument for Theresa May to play out the EU 27, to sort of offer them more in different directions. But we have more of an interest, I think, as a European, as well as a Dutchman, in th our shared future, in a European sovereignty in which the Dutch can play a constructive role alongside France and Germany in shaping a Europe that's more prosperous yeah. and, and more peaceful and more secure than something that we have now. Are there any other questions? I'll go to you, and last question, maybe? I'll go to you, because he hasn't asked the question yet. Uh, yeah, I have two ticks also. One is about uh, uh, UK always have been the pain in the ass of Europe <laughs> for years. And uh, uh, if you're negotiating now about leaving, that will uh, not be a good uh, uh, starting point for negotiations, I think, because they will, uh, yeah, they will always be doing difficult about things. Huh? There's one point, and the second thing is that uh, if you look at the whole world picture, huh, uh, from a global point of view, you could say that we are now busy with a global reorganization, and we're talking about world leadership also. And it is not very clever for the UK to start this Brexit because that will be about negotiation and not about strategy and growing, yeah. while their relationship with the US is also very difficult at the moment. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. If you see Trump and yeah. the Major of London, and now they are reacting to each other. Yeah. Yeah. So it will not be a good for the UK also. So in the end, uh, having a good relationship with the US was always dominant in their power. So, it's not a, so in the end, they, they are losing eh, yeah. on two fronts. Yeah. Let's add one time a little more Trump in the discussion, and then yeah. I'll go to <laughs> you for the last question. Fintan. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right. That's very briefly, I think, I think you put that very well. I mean, one of the great ironies of Brexit is that Britain uh, you know, is presented as British independence. And in fact, we're already seeing Britain drifting towards being a vassal state of the United States, you know, because the only other power block to which it can attach itself is, is, is the US. Look at uh, Theresa May's inability to criticize Trump's pulling out of the Paris Accord. She couldn't even come out directly and criticize it. There was a joint statement by you know, the, the prime ministers of the major states. She wouldn't sign it. Very straightforward statement saying, you know, this is a really bad thing. Uh, look at her inability to call Trump out on attacking the mayor of London, and you know, in, in the aftermath of a terrorist attack, extraordinary stuff. So you're already seeing, even before Brexit has has, has, has entered uh, into the negotiation phase, that Britain is drifting towards being a kind of lapdog of of, of Trump's America. And, Again, that's a very depressing sort of position for a proud nation like Britain to be in. Yeah, there, there's the last question oh, here. Yeah, um, I was wondering, because you were talking about 
when reality reasserts itself, Britain is going to want to join the European Union again. And all the mainstream parties seem to have the position that when they do that, there should be another referendum, or at least they've been calling for a referendum on the result of the negotiations or a second referendum on whether they want to be in the EU at all. I, I, I sort of I wonder, shouldn't we be asking the question of, is this referendum a useful instrument at all? Isn't it a very blunt instrument that shouldn't Brexit serve as a cautionary tale for any referendum, even if it, the potential outcome is something that we implicitly find good? Um, shouldn't, shouldn't we sort of, shouldn't there be a political party who says no more referendums? That's my question. Okay, I think that's also a bit of a discussion night at all, but <laughs> let's just keep it shortly. Is a referendum a good tool? So, um, there's nothing in principle wrong with a referendum, but, but on a, a, a referendum that permanently affects the constitutional status of the polity in which you exist, there should at the very least be a requirement for, say, a two-thirds majority. You know, uh, A simple 51% majoritarianism is a dreadful, dreadful way of doing this. The problem is the British have fetishized it at this, this moment. And the only way to undo that psychologically is going to be with another referendum, even though I agree with you that it was a terrible way to decide this in the first place. If any politician or any party tries to undo it, without a popular vote. What you're going to get is the worst thing you can get into your political system. The worst poison you get into a democratic system is betrayal. You know, the accusation of having betrayed the people, stabbed them in the back, all that kind of rhetoric becomes extremely nasty and we know where it will go and where it will turn. So the, it seems to me the only ultimate way out is going to be a second referendum. But I think a second referendum in the circumstances of a disastrous Brexit, of the kind of economic um, cost that we know is going to be paid, and in the context of a shifting political situation whereby you know, people's minds are, are, are obviously changing and, and are very, very malleable, um, I think it would be possible to win a second referendum. Um, on the basis of saying, we tried it, it, it was an honourable failure, and let's go back. The Brits have a very strong cultural attraction to uh, glorious failure. <laughs> and maybe in the end, you know, Brexit will be like um, Island One or one of those kind of colonial adventures, you know, where they got slaughtered, and they, you know, instead of hmm. weeping over it, they carried the flags back to uh, Westminster Abbey and put them up in an, in, on an altar somewhere. Maybe we'll see the altar, you know, decorated with the flags of Brexit as a, a sort of past glorious failure, which will, which will be honoured and forgotten. Sh Shall we finish this night with a uh, uh, sentence that they have an appetite for glorious fear, or do you have some last wise words to add to this? Only that when the second vote comes, when we have a chance to change this, don't just vote, but also help out with the campaign in general. Yeah. Um, I think we, uh, we have a good tradition in the body which is called the third half, and that's at the bar. And since <laughs> we're among us with about 40 people, we might all uh, just talk a bit more there with a drink in our hands. Um, for now, I would just really like to thank Felix Kloss first, but also uh, Vinton, who came all the way from Dublin just to be here and talk with us. So give them a warm hand of applause. <laughs> And for now, the bar is open and a good trip uh, home. Thank you very much.